it goes back to the why, uh, knowing why why you're going through your life. And it's not about changing careers. It's about growing as a person. Mm-hmm. That's my why, to grow as a person so that I can tell my son, like, hey, son, I'm not an immigrant in terms of changing countries and stuff, but I'm willing to change my path in life all the time so I can grow. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hi, guys. Welcome to another episode of Lessons from a Quitter. I'm so excited to have you guys on. You're in for a treat today. The episode with Dr. John Pham is so interesting and inspiring. He has such a cool story, and we will get to it in a second. I did want to bring up a lesson that I've kind of learned through this podcast in the last couple of months. We've talked a lot about how when you focus on the sunk costs, when you look focus on like, oh, but I've spent 10 years getting this degree and climbing the corporate ladder, that if I leave now, it's just all wasted. You're not looking at the opportunity cost that you're giving up by staying somewhere that you're unhappy. So you're not looking at the next 30 years that you're going to be doing something you don't like just so that you don't, quote unquote, waste the last 10 years. Um, I think that's a concept that's fairly understood. But again, it's this like mental fallacy that we have in our mind. We focus, we don't want to give up, we don't want to waste things. So we try to hold on to that stuff. And it's something that you need to shift your perspective on. Well, another perspective shift that I've recently had has been in this other kind of stumbling block that seems to happen for a lot of us. And that is, you know, other people's opinions and being so worried about what other people think. I've talked about it numerous times that it is a huge block for me. And when I was doing this podcast, that was one of my biggest fears is what are people going to say? What are the judgments I'm going to get? And a lot of times I bet when you guys have want to do something and you're thinking about it, about what other people think, there's like specific people in your family or your friends that you can like see their face, you know, might be a critical person or might be someone that you know just won't get what you're going to do. And you can almost like hear what that person is going to be snickering about or saying behind your back or whatever. Um, And I know I had that. Like I had people that I was like, oh, God, what is this person going to say once they see this podcast? But, you know, I worked through whatever fears I had and I put it out there. And what's been interesting is the last couple of months have been incredible to see how many people like listen to the podcast and promote it and share it and say that it's one of their favorite podcasts, like things that I just never thought about. And one of the coolest things is like I'm doing, for instance, on Instagram, I'm doing um, these 30-day challenges. I basically am just taking my goals for 2019 and making them bite size challenges, like a different challenge every month. So in the hopes that like over the year, I will make some big changes. And I chronicle that on Instagram. And I've been getting people like tagging me saying like, oh, I was inspired by Goalie doing her 30-day challenge. So I'm going to do it, you know, a similar one. And I mean, it's always such a cool feeling, but it's funny because I never even thought about that. Like I never thought while I was focused on people that were going to say bad things, I was never thinking about how many people I would connect with that were like-minded, that loved what I did, that really got it and how good that feels, you know? And what's been the biggest surprise is I also... A lot of the people that I thought were going to be judging me, and they might have in the beginning, have reached out and been like, I love your podcast. Like, I'm so inspired by this. And I'm always like a deer in headlights kind of caught like, what, you? Really? But I mean, it goes to show you that you don't really know what people are thinking or what they're going to say. It's just been an interesting lesson to me that like whenever we're focusing on the bad and failing and what's going to happen if this doesn't work out, like you're not focusing on how incredible it can be and who you can connect with and what kind of community you can build or tribe that you'll get that you want to be around. And I'm certain people do say bad things, but like I don't hear it. And even if I did at this point, like the good outweighs the bad so much, like hearing from people's messages and emails and DMs about how much they relate to the podcast. Like I don't even care anymore, you know, but 
I almost didn't put it out there because I was so worried about what people would think. And I just think that that comes up a lot. Like there is this real fear of like not making waves or not. And, and you know, you yeah, the easiest way to not have people talk about you is to never do anything. Sit in your comfort zone. Don't make any splashes. Don't make anyone uncomfortable. And don't live the life you want so that nobody says anything. But honestly, obviously, what's the point of that? So I hope you take that into account. You know, like we need to shift our perspective from always focusing on the negative and figure out like, what are those opportunities? Like, what if this turns out to be better than you could have ever expected? Isn't it worth it? You know? And actually, I think that that is kind of a good topic for the interview today with John, because as you'll see from his story, I'm so inspired by the fact that a lot of other people on his journey wouldn't have taken the steps because it's too hard or you would be going up against family dynamics and wishes from your parents and things that we all get burdened by. And I love that he is so strong in his why and why he's doing stuff that he is taking each step that he thinks is the right step for him. He has one of the, I think, the most turns I've seen on this podcast. And when you look back, it all kind of connects and he uses his experience throughout all these different ventures in what he's doing now. But as he will talk about, like it wasn't a clear path. It wasn't something he knew that he was going to do like this next thing. He just kept going. And as you'll see, you know, he grew up the son of immigrant farmers. He watched how much his parents had to struggle and work just to survive. And that clearly, you know, imprinted on his own work ethic and what he wanted to do with his life. He went to school for engineering and ended up dropping out and going to a startup back when the tech bubble was in place in late 1999, early 2000. And then that failed. And he had to go back to school to get his engineering degree. And he became an engineer, which for a lot of people, would, you know, that would be it. But you'll hear that he went back and decided, you know, he wanted to be a dentist. And so he goes back, gets his uh, doctorate, and decides that he wants to be an orthodontist. So he goes to three more years of school. And in the process of that, like when he thought like, okay, I'm going to work as an orthodontist, he meets this co-founder and they come up with this incredible concept of invisible braces and they create a company called Inbrace. They've now gone on to raise $25 million. They've grown this company in two years up to 75 people. I mean, it's like this rocket ship story. It's so incredible. But the best part of this interview is just how honest and real John is. I don't think, you know, he's not trying to paint a picture that everything is amazing. It's hard and it's hard work, but really focusing on why you're doing it is what gets you to the next step. And I just love the wisdom and the message he shares. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk to John. Hi, John. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, Goli. I am so excited to get into your story. I think that there's so many interesting things to cover. So let's kind of jump right in. Can you tell us a little bit about like what you thought you were going to be, what you originally went to school to do? So I'm originally an engineer by training, and I became an orthodontist. Uh, done a couple of startups in my life, and now I have the opportunity to do a startup. And what we do now is we create invisible braces that go behind your teeth. So cool. And really try to improve people's lives, you know, by giving them a, a, a better lifestyle and a smile that they've always wanted, always deserved. So you went to college for engineering, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. And what was like your goal with that? What were you thinking you were going to be doing after college? You know, where I am now, it's one of those things where you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Right. You can't really do it going forwards. I think it really starts from my upbringing. And there's this kind of this, this quote that I have is that, you know, we're all immigrants to some extent, especially here in the U.S., right? And my parents were immigrants from Vietnam. They came during the war and as refugees, they really didn't, ha- didn't have any skills. They came here with no money, but they were farmers back in Vietnam. So they came here with a couple of seeds in their hands and they started what I call ghetto farming in, in East L.A., <laughs> We grew up in in sort of the the ghettos of East L.A. and they were just planting on the sidewalks, you know, these Asian herbs. And that's how we made money. And so, you know, when you're driving on the freeway, you see those kids on the side of the road selling oranges and fruits and vegetables. That was me. Wow. So eventually over time, we we saved up enough money to get our own piece of property out in the Inland Empire. Mm -hmm. So in the Lake Elsinore, Riverside area. Our home then became sort of this halfway home for other refugees coming from, you know, war-stricken countries to get on their feet. So, 
you know, from a really early age, that kind of instilled in me certain things, you know, the power of working with people and finding opportunity, no matter what hand you're given, uh, learning how to be scrappy, right? Um, and learning sort of some of the early things of entrepreneurship. What, what really stuck with me, and this is going to tie in to kind of today, but what really stuck with me is I remember we would fill up our van with this produce and then drive to the 99 Ranch or, you know, these Asian markets in Orange County. My mom was a beautiful woman in her mid-30s. I, I would go with her. I'd watch her wheel and deal and sell this, you know, produce. And then at 6, 7, 8 p.m. at night, we'd come back to the same store that we sold to, go around in the back, and we'd go dumpster diving wow. in the trash can to pull the boxes back out to save 25 cents. Wow. You know? Mm-hmm. And so... You know, those, those images really stick with me uh, still to this day, you know, about, about what you need to do to, to survive. But also, when, when do you have to draw the line between saving a penny and making the dollar, right. right? So, you know, fast forward 10, 15 years, and I get to college. I'm the oldest son in, you know, in the family and first person in the family to go to college at UCLA. Go Bruins. <laughs> and it's during 1999, so it's a tech boom and everything, so... I said, you know what? I'm not going to go dumpster diving. <laughs> you know, yeah. my parents wanted me to become a doctor, and I said, no, nope, I'm not going to do that. I want to. I'm going to be a tech guy. So I drop out. Wow. I joined a tech startup. Was that hard telling your parents that? I'm assuming with that kind of an upbringing. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Are you kidding me? My my mom and family had a heart attack. Oh my god. And so. I told her, hey, mom, I promise you, if this doesn't work out, I'll be the doctor you always wanted. Mm. <laughs> but right now, I, I, I need to do this thing. Because, you know, Asian parents, they yeah. want all the- But that takes a lot of courage. I mean, I just have to say that a lot of people have dreams or see an opportunity. You know, at the time, maybe it was the tech boom. And a lot of people see that. But that weight and that burden, especially growing up and seeing your parents have to work so hard, you know, for 25 cents or for whatever it is, it keeps so many people stuck in that traditional, safe, secure route because there's this burden or this guilt of like, I owe it to them. So I think it takes a tremendous amount of courage to say like, I want to try this other thing in the face of that. Well, thank you for that. And I think I was just lazy. I didn't want to go to med school. <laughs> <laughs> but, so, you know, we do the tech thing. It's a, you know, internet startup. I, I think at a young age, you know, we, we, did, we did pretty well. I think I learned a lot of things early on was just, you see what, sort of money does to people, recognition does to people, because we had a really quick climb to fame, I guess. But one of the best things that happened to me was a tech crash, because then you really kind of realize what matters in life, yeah. and it's not the money, it's not the recognition. Ego is the enemy. I will tell you that for sure. Yeah. I saw a lot of friends of mine buy Ferraris and Lamborghinis and all those things, and mm. living the Puff Daddy lifestyle <laughs> before Puff Daddy even existed. <laughs> but then when you strip all that away, and you're just naked again, just a regular person, yeah. you kind of really see what matters, you know? And it's not any of that stuff. Right. It's the stuff that money can't buy. That's so important. And it's so, it's incredible to have that hindsight and say like, that was the best thing. But at that time when there's like this crash and everything, you know, when you go from that flashy lifestyle or living or, you know, thinking that that's the end goal to really kind of being humbled by an event like that, that had to have been really difficult mentally to go through. Yeah, I mean, it, it was, but thankfully, I had a really good mentor. And when I started the whole thing, and I was doing my climb, he told me from the beginning, like, hey, it's not, what is it? it's not what you get that matters. It's who you become while getting what you, what you want. Oh my God, I love that. It's not what you achieve. It's who you become yeah. in achieving your goals. So after the tech crash, I went back to school, finished my degree in engineering, worked at Boeing, and... My mom keeps nagging me the whole time. Hey, son, you you remember what you promised me? <laughs> you remember what you promised me? So while I was working at Boeing, I was concurrently studying for medical school and dental school. I was kind of wavering between either medicine or dentistry. Wait, engineering, that just wasn't enough for either your parents or for yourself? Like, Was it more the status of being a doctor or dentist or the money? I mean, what was it? Because engineering is a... Pretty great degree and a stable career. So what was it that was like the push to be a doctor or a dentist? From my parents, it was probably a cultural thing where it's respected. There's a status component of it. And I mean, it's it's a stable career, especially in California. 
I mean, California exports engineers and doctors. That's what they do. So th- that was their push. I've always loved engineering. And engineering to me doesn't mean necessarily math. It means applying what you learn to life. Applied learning to me is engineering. You know, I eventually applied to dental school, made it into UCLA. And I left my career at Boeing. And that kind of started my next chapter in dentistry. My goal at the time was just to graduate, become a dentist, buy a house, start a family, you know, so on and so forth. I've had a girlfriend kind of this whole time. And (laughs) she keeps telling me like, hey, you know, we should get married soon. I keep telling her, hey, the next thing, don't worry, the next thing. You know, right right after engineering, you know, we can get married. Oh, and I'm right after dental school, we can get married. (laughs) But in my last year of dental school, I decided to specialize and become an orthodontist. And so, you know, this is like a one level up or further. So I committed to another three years of residency at USC. And at USC was when I met my co-founder, Dr. Hong Sheng Tong. He was a bone biologist, orthodontist, very brilliant man. Wow. And he wanted to advance orthodontics, change the technology to give patients something that's more aesthetic and more lifestyle oriented. Before you kind of go into how you guys come up with this business, so dentistry is what, four years and then your residency is another four years. So seven. Four plus seven. Yeah. So another seven years of schooling. So in this time, before you have this idea, I mean, were you thinking that you want to like start a business in this or were you liking it? As like, did this seem like, okay, opening up a dentist's office seems pretty cool? I love people and I love engaging with people. So, yeah, you know, dentistry, orthodontics opened up this whole world for me where you can really engage with people every single day. I'm not a desk person. I'm always up, up, out and out and running around. So yeah, it, it did appeal to me. And, and the part of owning your own business appealed to me too. And dentists tend to own their own business. I did not think I'd go into this whole startup tech innovation oh, thing interesting. again. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. So when you become an orthodontist, Did you practice at all before you kind of did go into this tech innovation field? Yeah. So while I was in orthotic school, so this is residency, we came up with this idea. I was developing it and I was sort of, you know, practicing the whole time. So, you know, I I still had to bootstrap it to get it off the ground. So when I had graduated a number of years when I was practicing and doing this sort of startup garage thing for a year or two. Until we finally received some, you know, venture capital funding. And here we are now. So we raised about $25 million in venture capital funding. That is amazing. Our team grew from seven to 75 people in just under two years. You know, we're raising our next round of capital soon. And it's just been a wild ride. (laughs) It's been a wild ride. That seems like a rocket ship ride. So you guys were developing what you were saying earlier is an invisible braces behind your teeth. Right. Obviously, you guys saw like this need in the market for that when you were practicing. And so when you were saying that you kind of said you worked on it, bootstrapping it for a year or two, what did that look like? I mean, was that like a nights and weekends, like you're working as an orthodontist and you're developing a product with your co-founder, just you two? Or like, how does that even start? (laughs) That looks like you wake up at 6 a.m., change some diapers, brush (laughs) your teeth, go to work. While you're working in between patients, you're taking phone calls from investors, you're calling engineers, you're drafting things, you know, you're working through lunch, yeah. right? As an orthodontist, you're seeing about 100 patients a day. Oh my so God. it says, I don't know how we did it, <laughs> but we were just trying to fit everything in whenever we could, right? I was always doing two, three things at once. And then, you know, so you work from 9 to 6.30, 7 o'clock, you come home, hug your kids, change diapers, eat take phone calls all at the same time, (laughs) brush your teeth, rinse and repeat, (laughs) and you do it again, and you do it again. But, you know, this is where I think, you know, it's not about the money. If if you're doing a startup, you're doing anything for the money, you'll never really get to kick into that next gear that really matters, Mm -hmm. you know, that really gets you to break through. And it was a passion thing to me, right? It still is. So that's why we do it. One of the things that I think a lot of times people don't understand when they look at like the startup scene, and I was realizing this when I would go to a lot of OC tech startups, is that people just like come up with an idea and they try to get funding, which like doesn't work like that. And you were just saying that you had to bootstrap in order to show investors. And I'm assuming the fact that you were in the tech startup scene when you were in college obviously helps you to understand this. So what did you guys have to be able to like produce in order to be able to even like think about getting funding to grow this business? Was it like you had to have a prototype or did you have to like actually start using this product? (laughs) Well, I put it on myself. Uh, Oh, really? 
Yeah, you're gonna drink your own Kool Aid. So uh, I think I think it helps when you give your pitch and then you say, "Hey, in fact, I'm wearing it myself." Oh, interesting. But, so you guys had the product developed, and you know, it wasn't like an idea. It was legitimately a product that you had, and that's how you went to investors. We weren't a solution trying to find a problem. We were a problem that found a solution, and we're trying to get funding for that, right? And we had something that I think everyone could relate to. And this was stuff that I learned maybe back selling <laughs> selling fruit with my mom. You know, if everybody needs to eat. You know, everybody has a problem they're trying to solve. And you just got to be able to tailor that message in a way that connects with them. To grow a team that big and raise that kind of funding and, and to really go from obviously being a dentist and working maybe one-on-one to like being this CEO, what's been the most challenging part of this business? It changes as we grow. It's like being a parent. Being a CEO of seven people is much different than being a CEO of 75 people. Yeah. And uh, maybe we'll be at 750 people soon. And that's going to require something else of me. So I definitely don't know what I don't know. And I really, really rely on my mentor network. I'm really big on mentors. That's what I've learned. So I always try to surround myself with people much smarter than me. And I try not to tell my team what to do. I try to have them tell me what to do. (laughs) Because they're supposed to be smarter than me. Right? Like my wife. Like my wife. <laughs> right? uh, the most challenging part is, it sounds simple, but knowing why. Because it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. I mean, going back to the refugee story, I mean, my parents went on rickety boats <laughs> in the cover of the night getting shot at by communists. You know, But they, they made it you know, here and they survived because they had a why. And the why was they had to survive. They had to carry on the family. They had to move things forward for the fam family. Right. I think for me, and it's not always easy, but sometimes I need to look at myself in the mirror and say, well, why am I doing this? Is it for me? Is it for money? Is it for the team? And that why changes. It yeah. grows as my company grows. That's incredible. And I think that's 100% true. And I think even if it's not in a company or when I think f- for so many of us, we do things kind of an autopilot. It's like a path is laid out and you just keep going. And that's why I think so many of us find ourselves in a place where maybe we're not happy. And it coming back to figuring out like why you're doing anything, what you want it to be, like what the ultimate purpose of either your work or the person you want to become. I mean, it's so important to keep going back to that. I think you're absolutely right that it is hard work, but it seems simple and it's not that simple. And it's something to constantly keep at the forefront. But I find a lot of times people don't do things or keep themselves stuck because they think like, who am I to do that? Like, I don't know how to do that. Or I don't have any experience of that. And I'm assuming like for you, you've never had a company that had 75 people before, you know, or, or done this kind of fundraising and stuff. So where do you think that you gain kind of that confidence, you know, to go about to setting out to do things that you haven't done before? Well, this is my first podcast I've ever done in my life. <laughs> uh, I feel honored. And I jumped into it because I was uncomfortable. And that's one of the things I learned from one of my mentors, the same mentor early on, was that you do the uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable, and that's how you grow. Yeah, a lot of these things I didn't know how to do, but you got to start somewhere, and you just fail forward. That was the approach. You know, I, I found the best investors that were out there, and just knocked on their door. Or I found somebody that knew them. And I didn't make it about myself, I just made it about the mission, so that I don't take any failure personally. And, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another. You strike luck here and there. And then, you know, here you are now. I love that. One of the reasons I asked that is because, you know, that's the answer with a lot of people I talk to. And I think that sometimes when people are watching maybe from the sidelines, they think like other people have it figured out or they just know what they're doing and they created this company. And I, you know, <laughs> and that's, yeah, you laugh because I really want to show that like no one knows what they're doing. They're just stumbling along and putting one foot forward. It's just like my parents on that rickety boat when they came to America. Just hop on the boat and row. <laughs> I mean, we have plans here, but there's a fog in front of us. And when are we going to hit shore? I don't know. Yeah. Right. And it sounds cliche, but when people join this company, I tell them, first off, it's risky. I can't promise them anything. I can't promise them we're going to IPO. I can't promise them that we're going to get acquired and make whatever, a couple hundred million dollars. But I can promise them that as long as we try to be better every day, that we'll grow as individuals, and that you'll be around the most amazing people you ever met. One of the things I'm most proud of here is not the funding. It's not sort of the size of the company. It's that growing from 7 to 70 in a year and a half, two years, we still have maintained a culture. And we were actually awarded Orange County's top workplaces. Oh, that's awesome. Everyone knows each other's names. Everyone's happy to come to work. People smile. They hug each other. I mean, that's the stuff that I'm really proud of. You know, because that's part of the journey. 
That is incredible. And that is very difficult to do. Like when there is such rapid growth and new people are joining every day. And so to be able to do that is quite the accomplishment. And just going back really quickly, I know you said that you credit mentors for a lot of this. And do you have any advice for people on like how to find mentors? We hear this a lot, like be in rooms, you know, with people smarter than you. How do you find those rooms? You know, how should people go about like if they want that help? I think it starts with myself. It starts with you. First, you got to be somebody that's willing to take help and you got to be humble and you got to be someone that people would want to coach because, you know, I found that everybody who's been somewhere had somebody that helped them. So when they get to a certain point, they just want to, they just want to pay it forward. And so my promise to my mentors is that I'll pass on what they taught me to somebody else. And I mean, I learned from everybody. I learned from the people that stay late here and clean our building for us. Right, right. They've gone through some kind of challenge. You know, so a mentor doesn't necessarily mean just a business mentor. There's life mentors. There's all types of mentors. My grandma is one of my best mentors. You know, she doesn't have a penny in her bank account, <laughs> right? But I can sit there and talk to her for hours about life. So how do you find mentors? I mean, mentors are just friends that you learn from, I, I guess. That's how I would phrase them. All of us have friends. No, I love that you said that. I, I do think that once you're willing to get help or are seeking that knowledge, you put yourself out there more and then you end up like, being around people that you learn from, you know, it's different than just sitting and wanting something. I think the more you kind of take that action, exactly. it kind of just shows up. The chief technology officer of Boeing Corporation, who, you know, he's the head engineer. He, he manages 120, 150,000 engineers oh my God. at Boeing. So when I was working there, he was my boss's 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 right. boss's boss. <laughs> just recently joined our company. No way. Yeah, as a board advisor. That's incredible. You know, I mean... He's now my mentor to help me with supply chain, manufacturing, engineering, all these things. Who would have ever thought? I know. <laughs> you know, and I mean, how did it happen? I mean, it was one of these just random things where, he, you know, he just happened to become a patient randomly. And, you know, I recognize his name and, you know, kind of things happened. But sometimes, you know, not to get kind of esoteric about this, but sometimes you just got to be open yeah. to the world, open Absolutely. to the universe. Absolutely. And keep your eyes open. You know, don't be a jerk or I don't know if I can use this language here, but I have a quote here. Don't be an asshole. You know, <laughs> give, 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 give. Yeah. And and yeah, you know, you keep giving, it'll come back. So anyway, you know, my boss's 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 boss at Boeing. That's so is, amazing. You know, now my mentor here. Some of the, the top manufacturers of dental companies that I used to buy from, like Danaher and you know, a few a few other companies are now part of our team here. They've, you know, joined or become mentors. 3M, I'm sure you've heard of 3M. The, the executive that ran the 3M Orthonic branch is now my mentor and joined this company. I mean, how did it happen? I don't know. I was just open to it. <laughs> but I think that's what it is. I mean, I think not that you're just open to it. First of all, like you're out doing something. You're building a company. I think a lot of times like people want something, but they're like sitting in their house wondering why they can't get a mentor. It's like, well, what steps are you taking for whatever it is that you want, you know? And, and then once you do that, it's funny how these doors open. I feel the same exact way, not like, obviously, I think yours is on a much grander scale. But even when I did this podcast, like forget my photo with business with this podcast, it's incredible to me the people that I've met. And the people first of all, I think one other side note is that people are so willing to help you were just saying that mentors like want to pass it along. And I think a lot of times we're too scared to approach people or even talk to them. And they're I've just learned from this, like reaching out to get guests and talk to people like people are so willing. But beyond that, I feel like if I had reached out to them before, I mean, I had nothing to reach out to them for, you know? So it's like once you start doing something, there's a commonality that you can touch base with. Like for you, like you, just starting this company and doing this stuff, you probably wouldn't be connected with that CTO if you weren't doing this because you wouldn't have a reason to be connected, you know? And so I think it, it is being open to the universe, but also taking action, like sitting in your house just wishing for a mentor yeah. is not going to do mean, anything. You can't just pray all day. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you got you to gotta meet God halfway, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. Yeah, there's so many things. I mean, I, I think the uh, title of this podcast is, you know, Lessons from a Quitter. And I think the successful quitters are quitters that don't ever fully quit. They just keep going, right? Mm -hmm. I mentioned I went to school at UCLA. I did not mention the first time I applied, they rejected me. Right. I didn't tell you that. And when I got in, I actually had to come in as undeclared because engineering didn't have any space. And I applied twice until I got into engineering. You know, right. when I applied to dental school, my GPA was too low because I was an engineer. Engineers have low GPAs. <laughs> right. So I had to apply there several times. You know, I love so that. it's like you can be down on yourself for 
30 seconds or whatever, a minute or whatever it is you want to give yourself, but you, you don't ever fully quit. You just go again. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, what your career is also a testament to, and I would love your thoughts on this. A lot of people, I think, fears become like kind of overblown and outweigh what the reality of it is. So we are scared to put ourselves out there because what if it fails? What if the company doesn't take off? What if, you know, a million what ifs? But I think from what your career has shown is that like, we act as this like an end all be all, but like, okay, like there's always something else that you can be doing or another path or like another door will open. How do you deal with that? Where it's like, you've clearly, you were saying, you know, dropped out of school, did the startup, then went back to school, then became an engineer, then had to apply to dental school, you know, with a low GPA, then did all this stuff. Has it become easier for you to kind of see like, okay, I'll try this. And if it doesn't work, (laughs) if it doesn't work, I'll do something else. You you want to know something? It may it may sound like I like change and I embrace change all the time, but I'm actually one of the most conservative people in the world. <laughs> I hate change. I hate change. But because of that, I need to do the uncomfortable until it becomes comfortable. It goes back to the why. I think I mentioned that before. Yeah. By uh, knowing why why you're going through your life, and you know, it, it's not about changing careers. It's about growing as a person, right? Yeah. And that's my why to grow as a person so that I can tell my son, like, hey, son. I'm not an immigrant in terms of changing countries and stuff, but I'm willing to change my path in life all the time so I can grow. The real change is what our parents went through, leaving their country, leaving right. their culture, learning right. a new life. That's the real change. Right. We, got, we got first world problems here. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think with that, I mean, everything you said has been so inspiring and wonderful. And I, and I honestly... I think it's such a wonderful example of what we all should be doing and and taking stock in our life and figuring out what our next step is. But do you have any other like parting words or advice for somebody that is in a career, maybe because their parents kind of push them in that direction or whatever reason, find themselves somewhere where they are stuck and unhappy and just don't know what to do from there? You know, Goli, that's that's a tough question because it's not like I figured it all out. Yeah. I haven't. Are there days I'm unhappy? Yeah, there are days I'm unhappy. I can talk about what I do when I'm in that situation. I, I said it before, I got to go back to the why, ask myself, why am I doing mm-hmm. things? And it helps me raise out of the muck. It really helps me weigh out what's important and cut the fat and you know all those things. I do a lot of reading. So if I can have the opportunity to kind of pay it forward. And you know, when I was really young, at 19 years old, my mentor, I came up to him and I said, hey, I'd like to be like you someday. He told me, okay, John, You should read this book. It changed my life, is what he told me. And that book was uh, John C. Maxwell's 21 Laws of Leadership. So I said, okay, fine. And he said, okay, two weeks from now, come back and we can talk about it. And then, you know, I can show you how to be rich. (laughs) So two weeks later, I come back, sit down with him, and he goes, hey, did you read the book? And I kind of go, oh, yeah, you know, I read a couple of chapters. And then he kind of told me, you know, John, yeah, we we should stop meeting. Mm. And I said, why? And he said, if somebody you want to be like, tells you that this book changed my life, you should stop and read that book. (laughs) You know, if Michael Jordan tells you, this is how I shoot free throws, and free throws help me become a six-time champion, you know, NBA champion, you should probably go and do it. So I guess the thing that I learned, and you kind of asked for some life pearls for me to pass on, is know your why, find a mentor, and life isn't so much about the hard skills. It's not about the tactics of how to this, how to that, right. right? It's really about the soft skills, you know? It's, it's about leadership, connecting with people, learning life stories from people, and then drawing that up, being an engineer and applying those life skills to your life skills to get whatever it is you need to achieve your why, whether it be happiness, money, friends, or whatever it is. Whatever that's worth, that's my parting thought. No, that's great. I, I think that's great. And I think even the way you started it out was brilliant because – Again, going back to this, you know, I know that's a tough question I ask, but a lot of times it's as if like someone has figured it out and it's refreshing to know, like even getting to a place that even, you know, raising millions and millions of dollars and growing a company, like we all are just figuring it out and you don't have the answers and there's days you're going to be unhappy and that's what everybody is doing, but you might be a couple steps ahead. So I think those points are very helpful. So thank you so much for being here, John. I really appreciate it. If people want to find you guys or maybe reach out, what's the best place for them to go? 
Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you want to learn about uh, what we're doing, you can look us up online. It's myembrace.com. The company is called Embrace, I-N-B-R-A-C-E, in regards to invisible braces. The best place where you'll find us is on Instagram, hashtag Embrace. Perfect. And uh, yeah, you're welcome to um, email me, John at My Embrace, J-O-H-N at My Embrace, if you have any questions about anything. That's very kind of you. I will link to all that in the show notes in case people can't write it down. Thank you again, John. I really appreciate this. Oh, no problem going. I loved that episode. I could talk to John forever. He is so inspiring and humble and wise. And I feel like he gave us so much to think about. But here are my three takeaways. One, know your why. He repeated it over and over again, and it is so important to get quiet and figure out without all the outside noise and everything around you, like what is it that you want out of your life and why are you doing what you're doing? Two, it is not what you achieve, but who you become while achieving that goal. This is gold. So many people I see want to be 10 steps from where they are. But the reason why this is so important is because you want to speed that up. But it's in that process, it's in those steps and those failures and those learnings that you change the person you become. Once you get to that goal, once you start that company and have X amount of employees and do all these amazing things, you turn into a different version of you. And that is what the goal should be. So speeding up just to get money or get you know whatever it is you desire is not the point. Focus on who you want to become. Three, get mentors. Seek help. You're not going to do this alone. So when you start putting yourself out there, look for people that are a couple steps ahead of you. You'll be surprised how many people want to help. Reach out and ask for it. And with that, I will see you guys on the next episode. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys and I'll see you on the next episode.